problem of working with films, from my point of view, with students and with most faculty, rest on two points. One is the assumption that perceptions are not culturally determined, or at least since Americans have no culture, they are not culturally determined. And number two, that film is a shortcut and a labor-saving device for the teacher. I think nothing is less true. The teacher who plans to use audiovisual devices for other than inducing sleep or in getting past an hour needs probably to do more homework on a piece of film or a piece of tape than he does if he's done his own abstraction and is presenting the students with abstraction. I want to take a series of pieces of behavior which are chosen by what we call the context control method. The context control method means that as far as possible, we're going to take you cross-culturally to 10 zoos. In the film, whenever possible, we had a mother, a father, and children. We learned how to abstract these particular pieces, and it is based not on random shooting, but on purposive shooting, on examining repetitive structure and then filming situations over a period of time from which these abstractions can be made. You will go from London to Paris to Rome to Madras to Mysore. India on film is so complicated that I nearly went crazy. For those, my friends here in the audience who work in India, God bless you. It is so culturally mixed up on a piece of film that I found myself tearing my hair and we jumped to Tokyo quickly, to Hong Kong, and then to Tokyo, and then finally to the United States. We want to start out in London. We will follow a family into the zoo. I want you to watch the father. It's a very characteristic, very characteristic scene. father remaining back there. Here comes the father. The children, the children dance around them, and we saw numbers of these instances. Father is carrying the food in a basket. Father is now going to engage in a very typical scene that we saw in the English zoo of absolute certainty on the part of the, of the male, usually the oldest male, that he can interact and have communication with one of the animals. You will discover father now in the presence of his admiring children talking to an owl. <laughs> He's saying to the owl, hoot, 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 and the owl answers. Mother says, isn't that dear? I'm working as a decoy while Mr. Van Vlack is filming. Now we're going to switch now to the perceptoscope and watch this scene. I think that one of the things that's particularly important in these scenes, which we noticed in the British zoos, was the absence of self-consciousness on the part of the major actor. For those who are looking for further generalizations, which we found brothers operating, the elder brother took the place of the father and played this particular role, had the kind of interaction, and the younger brother stood around in very much the same order of involvement and delight as we see here. We're now going to move over and begin a series of, of scenes with relationship to the elephant. Father is going to feed. He's already fed one, and what he's going to do is to talk to the second, to, to the greedy elephant. And he's going to say to him, fair play, fair play. <laughs> Insisting that he be fed in turn. He will now watch him bow to the elephant as he leaves. 
We're going to move now to Paris. The characteristic thing that we saw in the Paris Zoo of, of this nature was the relationship between the parent and the child and the animal. In a multiple of cases, and many more than one would, one would suppose in terms of any order of cultural uh, regularity, you will, see the, you will see the parent take a piece of food, put the piece of food into the child's hand, and then extend the child's hand to feed the elephant. And I think we'll see this now. You notice the hand going out, holding it. Also notice <laughs> that is that is a that occurred only in one zoo in the entire trip around the world, and we have never seen it in the American community. In repetitive sequences, every time the Frenchman fed, he wiped his hand. He had a he shook his hand, acted as though it was dirty, and cleaned them off. We see that with that child. The receptoscope permits us a degree of control. Notice the putting, putting the food into the hand. Notice right over behind it, another one is doing the same thing. Precisely the same operation. We move next to Rome. And in Rome, the thing that I want you to watch, you will see that the parents and the children feed themselves and the animals. This is constant. There is a constant self-feeding and animal feeding that takes place. Notice father chewing. Notice the lady down there feeding herself. Notice him feeding himself. She's feeding herself. Kids feeding himself feeding the elephant, kid feeding himself, father feeds himself, feed the, feed the elephant, child feeds himself, father chews. Now, whoa, hold it. This scene, this scene I kept in because of its very great beauty and because here you have a very different thing than we saw in Britain. In, in London, we saw the father involved with the animal in a peer-like give and take, including the bow to the animal at the end of their joint communion. In the Italian situation, I want you to watch closely because of the high body identification on the part of the children and the nursemaid in relating to the elephant and getting the elephant involved with them. This is a very different order of communicative relationship. Again, only in Italy did we see these, this to this extent and for this duration. Please go ahead. Notice she's feeding herself at the same time. Now, the trunk up, demanding the trunk, and this position. Again. I want you to watch this little boy. I hope you saw the beautiful pelvic thrust that the Italian girl rewarded the little boy with, in which she rolled her body backward and thrust her pubic region forward in absolute and complete and beautiful delight. Let's see it again, right? Could we go? <laughs> could we go backward and pick up one pelvic thrust? Look. All right, forward. We're going now, in India, when uh, Mr. Van Vlack was able to separate out of the mass scenes, which were terribly culturally confusing to anyone who uses their eyes, not looking at the remainder, at the cultural heterogeneity around them. But here he was able to find an Indian civil servant 
his child, and his wife. Now, the characteristic thing about the, all of the Indian films was the fact that the, of the kind of inattention to the elephant as something to be looked at. In this case, the animal is for a ride. However, I want you to watch the presentation of self, to use Irving Goffman's very excellent term, to watch the way in which this man, with his, what nature has forgotten, he's done with cotton, the, the little boy in his military uniform, and the wife. I also want you to pay particular attention when we get to the point of watching the complete and beautiful little dance of uncertainty as to the relationship between the sexes and the role of husband and wife in this particular kind of presentation. Please go forward, Mr. Van Black. Mother proceeds, feeding herself. Father becomes aware of the camera. If he's not already aware, then sure he was. Now watch the moment of indecision. He gestures to the father to come. Father indicates mother should come. Now the child is being instructed. He, he says, you get on first. She holds. He says, well, come on. Then she's uncertain about her footing. Signals him. He takes hold of her. All right. In this case, what you're seeing here is that the elephant is given money rather than being fed, and the elephant is then giving it to the priest or the keeper to give to the temple. There, it's very difficult to see the order of eye focus we're dealing with here. I think that the whole Indian thing needs to be looked at in a different way than I'm capable of. In this case, we have a father carrying a daughter. This is in Madras. And if you notice, the father raised his hand, moved it in concert with the movement of the trunk. The only involvement that you see is the involvement of the introduction of the animal to the child. We do not have verbal material here, which we should have. Now, I want to show you this, which is in Mysore. This is a typical scene of a family passing the elephant cage, not stopping. And I want you to see the tourists so that you can get the cultural contrast. This is a particularly useful teaching point. The disinterest, the passage through on the part of the Mysorean couple, I, I presume they're Mysore, and the complete attention and involved attention of uh, what Mr. Van Flack believed to have been either an Australian or a British tourist. Now, I want to move to a different dimension. We're now in Hong Kong, and we're going to see a father and a daughter, and you'll see a number of these situations in which the Chinese father gets down at the level of the child. For those of you who remember some of the elegant things that Dr. Rhoda Metro and Dr. Margaret Mead have done with culture at a distance, I think that this is one that is very challenging because we're going to see repetitively throughout these Chinese scenes a phenomenon which we saw nowhere else. Not only does the, do you get an internal barrier here of that cage, an external barrier, but you will discover that the Chinese space out away from the danger and will manipulate around that. This father and child who you're watching here are going to sit down and he will deal with her. Then she will, to his delight, to his delight, drag him away. I want you to watch this scene, and then we'll come back to the spacing out. Notice the distance. Child notices the camera. Now, this positioning is very characteristic. She's now pulling. Now, we get a teenager, very, very brave. 
Notice the swagger. He puts a piece of the sugar cane up there and then walks away. Completely nonchalant. Notice the spacing out, however, of the remainder. There he goes again with his challenge, swinging his hips. Real cool. Here we get a mother and child. Notice the same spatial relationship. One is almost tempted to talk about frontiers at this point, but I'd find it quite dangerous. Watch this young man. Takes his hand on the trunk, greets it, sets back to establish space. Here we go. Now, he's noticed the camera. We want to remind you that the camera is there, and we might possibly, although we doubt it, be dealing with an essentially uh, politeness on the part of the Chinese. Notice this typical position, father, son this time. Father's head slightly below the son in this learning situation. Boy's teasing, let's go forward. I'm going to show you a woman attempting to feed the animal. Notice the space now. You see the hand there with the food in it. We would expect her to go forward and feed that animal to at least get within trunk length. There again is a repetitive situation which remains unexplained. Again, those can get closer because of the distance to the elephant down there. Here comes the elephant. There's the hand. And here comes our boy across again. All right, let's go ahead, Mr. Benfock. We're now in Japan, as you might guess. We almost did not want to use this because it was almost too stereotypic. But it was so characteristic of things that we that we've seen in Tokyo, <laughs> of the use of the animal to be photographed against. This, again, is amazingly like some of the things that we see in the American Zoo. With the passive spectation on the part of the, of the Japanese father with this daughter. In this case, notice the, notice the maintenance of the hands, the child, and the balance anteriorly. The child is maintaining an upright position. Notice the father here, engaged in instruction, lean clear over. In order for the child to see his hand, to maintain the instruction. This is very different than the things that we see in the United States, in which the father may very well point but points from behind the child, rather than in this situation in which the child is carefully instructed. For those who are interested in proxemics, should pay very close attention to these orders of films, because we have a naturalistic situation in which the spacing out is highly, uh, highly subject to study in a naturalistic, not a, a pseudo-experimental situation. Grandfather feeds, no attempt to interest the child, a lone performance, the kind of lone feeder that you see in many places around the world. There's no involvement with the animal that we can perceive but a throwing. Again, the passive spectation, Margaret Mead suggests it's almost like watching television face that we will see particularly among our American group. And I did want you to see this picture. We're now in San Francisco. We're going to watch late teenagers feed the elephants, and if you will, in your mind's eye, think of them at a carnival throwing pennies into dishes. I think you will get a good picture of what's going on here. It is a competitive kind of throwing to the animal. The little boys are rewarding them and imitating them, and they're pitching food, but it's not about animal feeding. But let's just jump right straight on through into, into the Philadelphia Zoo. The thing that one feels in watching in the Philadelphia Zoo, like the New York Zoo, like the Chicago Zoo, is the extent to which people just go past the situation. Go past the animals. There is a throwing, uh, very little focusing, a great deal of the business of people walking through the zoo, getting exposure, as it were. Father maintains this order of detachment. Now, she takes a hold of the boy's head and turns it toward the elephant. 
that's the order of pointing that you get. Not looking whether the child is looking, but just throwing the hand out and pointing in the midst of it. A more personal kind of uh, pointing where it's related to the fact that he should point rather than that they should see it. He's got the child, he's encouraging to, to feed. Please go ahead. Now, this is a very typical American zoo scene. These people are at the zoo to see the animal. If you notice, this is the only one even looking toward them. It's an extraordinary kind of thing to repeatedly see individuals going through a zoo, getting them only out of the corners of their eyes. All right. Again, I want you to see this mother. We saw her many times at the zoo. She points up in the air the animal that's down here. Her voice is in whine, or fetch, if you know a better word. She has now discharged her responsibility. We're now in our Mennonite Amish range. That one is carrying a little boy back there, hanging over his shoulder, around under his beard. Child up on top of father's head, behind it. So that the communication has to be kinesthesiological here some verbality, but largely tone of voice rather than in terms of the content of the material. Yet he has muscles here, muscles here, hand here that are sending signals. I want to show you one father going through, exposing his child to the animal. This is again this, this spectation that is so characteristic of us watching TV. The same face. When there is looking, there is seldom any involvement in body change. To show that this is not culture bound, you will notice this boy, the younger brother, is telling the older brother to look at something, and he is yawning. Again, standing next to a scene and reading a tour book about it and not looking at it. It's a repetitive, not focusing on it. That does not mean that they do not perceive it or take it in. But rather, there is a lateral, non-directed vision taking place here. We were impressed by the number of times that the animals were not fed, but the children were. So that when you took your first look at this, you discover over in this corner, the mother apparently feeding. But watch what mother does. Apparently feeding a child, but you put it in context, and you discover that it is the mother that's getting fed by the child. Now, this is a, this is a Pennsylvania Dutch theme. Mother constantly is supposed to look pleasant. If you notice, looking pleasant means that you expose the teeth. <laughs> I want you to watch father's non-involvement here. Okay, get it. <laughs> Let's go ahead, please. This is one I really want you to notice. Father is involved, daughter is out here, Watch daughter, touching daddy, touching daddy, getting no response. Fixes his glasses. Now, he points. Watch what daughter does when he reacts. Okay, do we have that on uh, perceptoscope? All right, I'd like to show you that scene because it is, it's a highly repetitive. This is being run about half speed. Notice the position of father. Maternal, maternal position here of the hands. Father moves, watch daughter's body. Father rolls him to shoulder toward her. She comes back, imprints her father. 
mother out here in a in complete statement of how she feels. But again, father is involved. Watch daughter, touching daddy, touching daddy, getting no response, fixes his glasses. Now, he points. Watch what daughter does when he reacts. Thanks, please. This technique of the utilization of stills taken from running film, of loops that can be played at varying degrees of slow motion. And I would advise that any one of those loops are about sufficient for a, for a day's class. There is enough information in one four-second loop for the average anthropologist who's willing to work on his material to get an entire day's class out of. I have asked you to go through a certain kind of jump around the world to get with me the impact of this kind of cross-cultural viewing of families for which you can draw your own conclusions. Thank you very much. You have just watched and listened to portions of a presentation made by Jacques Van Vlack and myself at the American Anthropological Association. In a sense, this has been an experimental film of experimental filming. Our original question was whether the presentation of conventionalized scenes from a variety of cultures could make a dramatic statement for my fellow scientists in such a situation as this, of cultural differences and similarities. There are zoos and families across the world. Could observation of these, the families visiting the zoos, provide us with regular patterns of behavior which could be filmed and compared later at the researcher's leisure? We felt that the material assembled demonstrated the feasibility of this method. That is, it demonstrated the feasibility if a cross-culturally trained individual managed the filming and he made the film after he or she had observed and isolated the events for recording. The footage is thus a record of observation, and not merely shots taken at random. The filming itself gave us data about ourselves as observers and as filmmakers, as editors. Jacques Van Vlack did most of the filming that you've just seen. He was trained as a, both as a social scientist although not as an anthropologist, and as, a, and as an audiovisual technologist. And he was the cameraman for this and other footage not included here. Review of, the raw, of this raw footage showed us that Mr. Van Flack, as do all cameramen, carried his childhood, in his case, a Western New York childhood, with him. This shaped his camera work. We include a portion of his experience for your examination. This is the Parisian restaurant, and I had my filmo. This scene is being slowed with each frame printed five times, as you can tell by our frame numbers at the top center of the picture. On my right was Ray Birdwhistle, and on my left was Ted Schwartz. My assignment in this experiment was to film interactions on my own volition and at the request of the anthropologist. The prime directive being, keep filming, once started, until the camera runs down. A girl at a magazine stand dropped some money, and as she picked up the bills, I started filming. And then I stopped the camera. Both anthropologists yelled, why did you stop? It's a pickup. Don't stop. Go on filming. I gathered my wits and filmed again. Okay, now what was it that Bird Whistle and Schwartz saw that led them to say that this was a pickup? Or rather, what was it that I saw through the finder of the camera that led me as a member of my culture to stop perceiving, that is to stop the camera?
She hit him once. She hit him again. And again for good measure. And finally, I caught on and stopped the camera. And away they go. And then on the very next scene, I shot a policeman. <laughs> I mean, I filmed the policeman. Another guardian against the events I might otherwise experience as a person or film as a cameraman. Professor Birdwhistle? Thank you, Jacques. As one last point. This is a piece we almost threw away because of the quality of the film. Yet when we finally got to it, we were very excited to discover that we had here a natural grid graph picture in which we could examine the family and examine some of the gambits of human interaction with actual measurement possible because of the fortuitous layout of the sidewalk. You notice this little girl coming in this direction, the one over in the lower left-hand side. You notice as they approach, the first girl ignores, the second little girl moves over, twists her ankle strange combination of events which uh, allows us to see at the same time cries for help, op operation of territory, the establishment of family territory, and coded surround for the family organization. The little girl going away uh, does not seem to have been particularly bothered by what could be called aggression, yet uh, she continues to watch it and be involved. You can see the gambits of caretaking, of nursing, of dramatic display, and yet the mother herself, uh, up there with the father, is not particularly exercised by all of this display. She's seen it before, she's gone through it, because this is a piece of family life, a way in which uh, we can watch the responses, we can watch the interaction within the family, notice the extent to which the father is totally uninvolved in this family scene, continues his interest in the animals. This is an exciting piece, because in a sense, it demonstrates what can happen within less than 10 seconds in a, in a family? Think of the number of 10 seconds there are in human life, the way in which culture is taught, the way it's, the way it's learned, the way, the way human individuals in the repeated actions and the organized patterning of a family become part of that family and learn to be members of, a, of society. This is a study not in, not in the magnitude of kinship systems, but in the micro world of the minute-to-minute, second-to-second life of social interaction.